Thank you. Thank you. All right, so as Chris mentioned, today in this talk, we are going to be speaking, our, I'm going to be speaking on personal growth and or running a business and keeping up with changing technology. It's a really long title, uh, but I'm going to try to distill it into some really practical steps. I'm going to start with two seemingly unrelated stories, but before we do that, uh, this is the farthest west I have ever been in the United States, so if I sound as if I have a southern draw, that's why. Uh, I don't think I have one, but people tell me I do. So anyway, I'm excited to speak on this topic because every other WordCamp I've been to, I've spoken on the developer track because uh, by trade, that's what it is I do. But when Chris asked me to speak on this, it allowed me to kind of step outside of my comfort zone. And for any of you who know Chris, you know that he likes to tell stories. And so this is going to give me a chance to tell a couple of stories that are more personal in terms of how I do what it is that I do for a living and I hope that it helps all of you and this is going to be geared towards people who are running a business who are maybe managing a development team who are developers running a business who are freelancers any of that but first I want to give a little bit uh, introduction as to who I am so you have some background before I get into these stories because otherwise as if the stories aren't maybe weird enough you're gonna think who is this guy so as you know, my name is Tom, so what's up, nice to meet you, all of that. I am, as Chris said, I'm self-employed. My company is Pressware. You can find it on the web at pressware.co. And I have been married to my high school sweetheart for eight years. We have two crazy terrier mutts who we've had our entire marriage, and we have two beautiful daughters that everything that I do, now I love my work, but everything that I do is a love of labor for my work, but most importantly, my family. Now, before we get started, and you can raise your hands or not, there's no right or wrong answer, so hopefully it's cool to raise your hand, but I wanna ask a couple of questions because it's gonna help me tailor certain parts of this talk. First, how many of you manage developers? Maybe you're a developer yourself, but you manage them. Okay, wow, great, you're brave people. Um, if how many of you are developers who answer to someone else either a manager or clients or customers okay great so either you manage them or you're or you're answering to someone else that's awesome i'm sorry or if you're managing yourself that works that i do the same thing so this will uh, this will hit on all of those points so um, if you have heard me speak before, you know that I normally encourage questions throughout the presentation, but for the sake of time and for the sake of everything I want to cover, that's not going to be the case for this. We'll hold, we will hold questions until the end. But enough of the introductory stuff. I want to start telling these two stories. And as a heads up, they're going to sound seemingly unrelated at first. And I'm going to use a little bit about where I'm from being the southeastern United States for the first story. And the second story will be more about computing. But hang with me through it because they will converge by the end. Okay, so a little bit before I got into computing or around the same time really, I had convinced myself that somewhere along the way in my life, I was going to play lead guitar in a rock and roll band. And it's funny because so many guys and girls that I know somewhere in their teenage years say, yeah, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to, I'm going to pick up an axe and I'm going to shred and I'm going to listen to, maybe I'm going to listen to Journey or maybe I'm going to listen to some other of my favorite bands and then I'm going to learn it and start a band. It's going to be great. And I believed this. I sincerely believed this about myself, despite the fact that I also had an insatiable curiosity about computers. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, I grew up listening to country music. I know that sounds almost like a cliche. Here's a guy from Georgia with maybe a little bit of a southern drawl talking about country music. I want to clarify, for those of you who are in the audience, I was raised listening to people like George Strait and Randy Travis and Travis Tritt and Johnny Cash and Hank Williams Jr. and his father Hank Williams and Merle Haggard and Chris Christopherson. The list goes on. Now, in terms of modern country music, I can't say I'm as big as a fan, not because I think there's anything wrong with it, it just doesn't appeal to my sense of music. But, above all else, what country music taught me, from a musical standpoint, the songs aren't that hard to learn, especially old school country, but when it comes to uh, what they're saying in the song, 
there it, it is exceptionally good songwriting in the fact that it is telling a story and the story is often I know I know what the I know what the cliche is it's it's they're gonna talk about relationships beer and maybe a horse or a truck but these old guys like Johnny Cash they they wrote about so much more uh, and and you hear that from other people like Chris Christopherson and Merle Haggard I mean these guys wrote really compelling stories in the context of country music but I really really love rock and roll and I really got into rock and roll the very first time so we had a local channel when I was in junior high school called the box and this was before TRL or Total Request on MTV where and it was a local channel where you call in you request a song that corresponded to a uh, to a key code or a, or a number you know maybe 101 or 527 or whatever and it would then queue up the video you wanted to see on this channel now how the channel made money I have no idea they had no commercials all they did was show videos and a phone number across the bottom and they had a ticker for what song and uh, what is it that you and, and, and the key code for the song that you wanted to hear but one day I was watching it was called the box music network and one day I was watching the box and the video for Metallica's Unforgiven 2 came on. Now, for those of you who are Metallica fans, you know that anything from load forward is, it's very divisive. But I had never heard anyone play guitar like I had heard Kirk Hammett and James Hetfield play at that time. And I was hooked. And I mean, it was, I'm going to go request that video again. And then in the meantime, I'm going to hop on the internet and look these guys up. So, at the same time, my dad had this huge uh, old record player sitting in our sunroom. And when I say huge, I mean it's like the size of a couch. This was a legit record player. And I, went, I started digging through all of his old vinyl records. And he had stuff from the Eagles, and he had stuff from a band called Boston, and he had stuff from a band called Foreigner. And I was like, I've never heard of these people. So I put on the records and it's just sit, spin the record and listen. And it was, it was a whole other world listening to this stuff. And I thought, this is, I want to learn to play guitar like these bands because this is awesome. So normally when someone wants to learn to play guitar, they're going to go buy the instrument or they're going to borrow an instrument. They're going to sit down and try to learn it. Now it's much easier now to learn how to play the guitar through various online courses and things like that. But I tend to be more of a fan of learning from people who have gone, who are, who are a little further down the road than you. So I began taking lessons. And I was learning top 40 music. And for someone who wanted to learn rock and roll and wanted to learn how to shred, Matchbox 20, as good as they are, was not what I had in mind when learning to play the guitar. But I went with it anyway. And here's the, the one well, there's a number of when, there's a number of advantages that this brought with it. But here's the one thing is that when I would then take my guitar to school and people would want to hear a song, because I had learned all of these top 40 hits, I could probably play the song that they knew. And people, for whatever reason, there's something about hearing someone play the guitar and playing a song that you know that's just cool, especially when you're a teenager. But this was a far cry from what I thought I was going to learn. And I don't want to say I was discouraged, but I was a little confused as to where I was headed. So anyway, this was the very beginning, or this was the proverbial gateway drug into me learning more about the guitar as an instrument and about music in general. So I had, as I mentioned, an insatiable curiosity both for computing and music. And this curiosity for music ended up uh, leading me into learning more about scales and theory and progressions and so I had this foundation of okay this is how songs are constructed and how chords work and things like that and then I was able to learn a lot more about uh, just the instrument and and how you play it from a theoretical standpoint because I had a little bit of a foundation on songwriting and this then moved me into listening to a wider variety of music. I mean, 
I have a picture of Bob Dylan up here, but then I started to dig into deeper cuts, as they call them, or deeper tracks of people that were not necessarily released on records. And these things, these, these were available on uh, Sirius Satellite Radio before the merger with XM. There was literally a deep cuts channel, and every time I was in the car, I was listening to them. The song sounded like they were recorded in a garage. And sometimes that's a interesting, uh, that provides a very interesting sound, sometimes it sucks. But you got to hear songs in their rawest form and you got to hear maybe demos or things that were just never released. So it helped you grow in terms of listening to what these guys and what these bands were writing on things that were never put on a record for the masses to hear or for the radio to play or for the record company to sell. Now. I was on track, I thought, to have my rock and roll band. So me and a few guys got together, I had a rhythm guitarist and my brother was playing bass and I had lead guitar and we had a singer and a drummer and we played a couple of gigs and it was like, oh my gosh, this is the real thing. There's people here listening to us and we're playing and some of it's cover tunes and we, we had written one song together because everybody's got to write one song even if it sucks and, uh, you know, I mean, whatever, but it, it was, it was awesome. And then that kind of fell apart for a variety of reasons. So then at the very beginning of college, I got in with another group and I played a few gigs with them and it was fantastic. I was playing um, some, some music that I loved, some that was I liked, but I was getting to play lead guitar and I was getting to perform in front of people and I was getting to really just enjoy the music. But then that didn't work out. So my last ditch effort was not to have a rock and roll band, it was just to create a CD of original tunes. And so the way that I did that was my brother who played bass, he and I got a drum set and we taught ourselves how to play the drums. And then he learned a variety of, I mean, he in terms of bass guitar just soared in terms of his conceptual understanding of how to write great bass lines. And then I, would, I learned how to uh, track, uh, we would mic up the drums, I learned how to track those, I learned how to um, run everything through a mixer and then I learned how to put everything together on a computer and then produce an mp3. So we went from having the box on TV before TRL now to where we're mixing mp3s on our computer. So we made a CD of about five or six original tunes and that was it. I didn't send it anywhere. I didn't, I, if I sang all of you would get up and leave. So uh, it was for fun. I learned a lot but and I, and I think one day maybe I will still go back to music more so than I am now. But the bottom line that I learned from as a young kid listening to, uh, listening to uh, country music, going up to rock and roll, going up to learning these songs, trying to do bands, etc., is that if, if I didn't know a song, I could learn it because I had the foundational understanding of the principles that would allow me to sit down hear the song, pick it out, or read the music, or you know, because of the internet, look up the tab, and then play it. Or another way to put it is if I didn't know a song, I could learn it. And then the more principles I knew, the easier it was to learn new material and to write new material. But then I blinked and it all changed. So as I said earlier, around that time I got into, I was also getting into computing. Now, I was convinced that computing was going to be some part of my life, even if I didn't know how it was going to lead me to where I am today. And that, that means both standing here in front of all of you talking about this, is also building software for other people. And that insatiable curiosity about music was just as strong for computing. Now, my family's first computer was the Apple IIe. And if you know when that came out, you know that I was a... I, I was too young to really get a lot about the computer. I knew that if I loaded these two huge five inch floppy disks in and I waited for it to it would load up this game and I would get to play it on a black and green screen and whatever. I had an Atari so I would go sit down and play an Atari because it had color and it had better sound and it didn't make these crazy noises and it didn't require discs. I just pop a cartridge in. But 
Um, shortly after we had an Atari, we then got a Nintendo Entertainment System. And I remember getting really curious on screen when I was playing by myself. I remember seeing all of these other characters interact on a screen. Maybe it was Bowser, or maybe it was Ganondorf, or something like that. And I, was, and I got really curious as to how are these things knowing what to do on screen? How are they reacting to what I'm doing? Or for the, for, the poor, for, the, for the lesser quality games, why are these guys not reacting to what I'm doing at all? And I remember asking my parents that, and my dad, who had, he, he's not involved in the computing industry at all, but he said, he's like, these, these gaming systems are computers, and they run, the games are the programs that they run. And that stuck with me, even though I didn't really know what to do with that. So around eight years old, we got our first PC, and it was a 386. I think it had one or two megs of RAM. It had Windows 3.1. And the guy who brought it over to set it up for us showed us, uh, after he booted into Windows, he showed us a uh, gameplay of Doom and Wolfenstein. And if you're an eight-year-old kid, and you, get a and you get a computer after you've been playing Super Mario Brothers, and you are shooting guns at demons, or at these, at these fictional Nazis on your screen, you're hooked. And so luckily, my parents were very into wanting to stay current with the trends. So the first internet service that we had was Prodigy. Did anyone here use Prodigy? Oh, wow, OK, awesome. So you remember Prodigy. Shortly after Prodigy, we got America Online. And that is kind of what blew the doors open into me starting to get into programming. Uh, as I like to put it, it, it's really what was me standing at the top of the slippery slope that I am still on today. So at 14.4 baud modem, I, start, I remembered my parents saying that the video game systems were just computers running programs, and I got curious as to here's this beige box, and here are these things on the screen, and I know I'm connected to a computer somewhere that we now call the cloud, and how is all of this happening? So, after spending about a year online and kind of exploring and, and breaking the computer and getting it fixed and breaking it again and getting it fixed again, I decided to get onto the forums that are on AOL, which, you know, this was, I mean, there, were, there, were, there, was, there was Usenet and bulletin boards and things like that that were happening online at the time, but in my super limited experience as a kid, I knew AOL forums and AOL chat rooms. So I got involved there. And I had stumbled across, I remember reading about Visual Basic. And I remember reading, like, this is a way to write programs for Windows. And then there was some jargon that I didn't understand because I was, I mean, I was too young. And I, I did not have any experience with, uh, when it came to start talking about APIs and memory management, pfft, whatever, I was too young. I just wanted to make cool things happen on my computer. So I got a copy of Visual Basic 3, and I learned enough to begin manipulating the Windows GUI. So the first thing that I wrote was not a video game, and the first thing that I wrote was not something really cool or really useful for people. It was a program that some of you may know, or they were called progies, and you, you would get online, and I learned how to manipulate the, because it was manipulating the Windows interface, I could then grab references to elements on the screen for America Online, and I could instant message my friends, and since it was a program, I could send them a flood of instant messages and kick them offline, and ha ha, look at what I did. And then there became this kind of subculture of people who were, run, who were writing progies, and you would trade with people, and then you're like, oh wow, there's people doing some really cool stuff. And so you get there, you, you say, hey, I'll trade you these two programs for, or I'll trade you these two progies for this progie, and I will give you the email address of this person, and you can try his pro Anyway, it became this whole like black market of, of these stupid programs. And that is how I learned to write my first programs on Windows. But then I learned about IRC. So I popped on IRC, began chatting with people. Wow, this is a vastly different culture. I mean, AOL was OK, but this is like cutthroat. So you play the part, and you sit there, and you watch, and you kind of lurk. And then I got exposed to Linux and C, C++, and some other, some other programming languages like that. Well, with, um, with Linux, this was before we were able to, uh, or where I lived, it wasn't easy for me to download the Linux, any Linux distribution. So I literally had someone mail me the CDs, or the CDRs, with a copy of uh, 
of I forget uh, Red Hat Linux, and I tried to install that on my machine. But my PC at this time, the graphics card, was not advanced enough to run X Windows. So here I am running Linux, which is supposed to be awesome by all the proclaimed computer nerds, and I can't get past the friggin' command prompt to launch a GUI. So anyway, I thought, well, okay, I, I know enough to still work with the command line, and I know enough to work with uh, a new programming language and run the compiler, and so I got a book on C. And they started talking about memory management and pointers and linked lists and on trees and I, I'm like maybe 10 years old and I thought okay I can't whatever so then I kind of put that aside and got into working on computers and tearing them apart and rebuilding them and it became a really expensive hobby I mean I started to take these computers apart and rebuild them sometimes they worked sometimes they didn't sometimes they caught fire that's not a joke and then I would have to tell my parents the computers on fire again I think we're going to need another one. And so, and so luckily, we were able to um, afford new computers. And my parents were fortunate and, and, and encouraging enough of, despite the fact that I, this was just a money pit, I was showing a keen interest in this. And so they, uh, they got me a Visual Basic 5 Professional Edition compiler along with two books. And I read them cover to cover. I did every exercise that they had. I learned things that I did not know that I could do. I stopped writing AOL progies. I got really interested in socket programming. Um, would write little chat applications, really client server applications and things like that. But this presented a problem because all of a sudden I was just as passionate about wanting to be a rock star as I was about wanting to be a computer nerd. And so I had to make a choice. Well. When I went to college, I opted to study computer science. And I went to the Georgia Institute of Technology, or Georgia Tech, I don't know what, I don't know even if you guys have heard of it out here, but it's an engineering school, and um, the computer science program is really strong. And I went there, and I loved everything I was learning. And I learned just how much I did not know, and I learned how hard, uh, or I learned how, how smart people really are. And you're just like, oh my gosh. I'm never going to be able to do what these people are doing. But you push hard, and you get better, and you study, and things get a little bit easier. And we covered things that went all the way from logic gates to processors and RAM to networking and theory and operating systems, assembly. Here I am back at C, except this time I'm actually able to write it. We talked about small talk and Java and so on and so on. We did the web, and we talked about emerging languages. And at the time, Rails was a framework that was really beginning to gain traction. But this bred a fear in me. And when I say fear, I don't mean that I'm giving this lip service. Like, I was legitimately scared. And the question that, keep com that kept coming up for me was, how am I supposed to keep up with all of this stuff, let alone find a job? So you've heard of FOMO, or fear of missing out. And I had uh, phone hajj which is fear of not having a job, because I don't know every single thing we're studying and I have no idea how I'm supposed to absorb all of this and learn all of this and be ready for the interviews and be ready to tackle all of this. And so while I was in school, I did a number of internships. And at this point, the internships, you know, they come in, they tell you what they want, you, they want to know about your projects and what you've worked on. And then I was working with anything from classic ASP and VB script and XML that was stored as a blob in a database. And uh, I could, that's, I, I digress on that. Um, and, and then I worked with a number of front end libraries. Now, before jQuery, there was prototype JS, which was a really neat JavaScript framework, but that's where I really got my feet wet with JavaScript. And I absolutely loved what I was doing. And so out of school, I worked as a software engineer for a major internet company. I had a fantastic boss. The culture was great. I had great benefits. Um, I looked forward to going to work every morning. It was challenging, I was learning a lot, but I knew that I wanted to pursue self-employment. And this is where the stories start to converge, because when I began my journey on self-employment, the question still remained, or the question returned of, how am I supposed to keep up with everything that's happening? And this, if you remember from earlier in the talk, with music, 
I said, if I didn't know a song, I could learn it. And the more principles I knew, the easier it was to learn new material. And though this was more or less founded or influenced by music, it became highly influential into how I began to view software. If I don't know a technology, I can learn it. The more principles I know, the easier it is to learn new material. Now, principles would be something like object-oriented programming or procedural programming. If you know the paradigm, learning the language is secondary. You can do that, but you've got to learn the principles. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and proceed into the last part of this presentation into which I want to talk about running a business. Now, for those of us who are self-employed or maybe we're a manager or we're at the top of a company or wherever it is, technology helps drive our business. If you have an online product or a piece of software, the technology that you're using helps drive that business forward. And we should also be striving to elegantly solve problems. And by elegantly, uh, Simply put, that does not mean we should cobble something together, ship it, and hope it works. This is not the Millennium Falcon where Han Solo is saying, hear me baby, hold together. This is a very well put together piece of software that is solving a problem for someone. And when we do it that way, it helps us continue to grow our products, and it helps our users because they have a very stable, very easy to, hopefully easy to use product. But this can be distilled into two points, and that is experience of what's available, or what you're using, an awareness of what's out there. Maybe it's on the horizon, maybe it's already been uh, delivered, or maybe it's about to be delivered, but it's experience and awareness. So how do you keep up with the technology? There are four points that I have. First, I think, I'm sorry? Okay, okay. Um, first, there are principles, and you need to emphasize principles and foundations over technology. And at some point in, develop, in a developer's career, you end up learning a variety of, prin of principles that are gonna transcend the technology that's being used. And when you're able to do that, you're able to pick up a new language and a set of tools after some learning. Now, if you're a manager, when you communicate something that your developers need to do, make sure that you explain to them the why behind the business need. Because as a developer, if, if I'm building something or if they're building something and they don't know why it is they're building it, it's gonna make it really hard to make a decision, an architectural decision or a techno technological decision on how to build it. The second point is go deep rather than wide. When I first started working for myself, I was doing vanilla web-based projects, I was doing Ruby on Rails, and I was doing WordPress. Fast forward a few years, I solely work in WordPress and the, ten and the technologies that are tangential to it. I am far more of a fan of being a, uh, I would rather not be a jack of all trades and master of none, but an expert in something or in a handful of somethings. And since I've made that choice, I've had more success, I've been more profitable, and I have loved what I've done. Three, stay aware of what's out there. You've seen things this weekend, such as maybe the WordPress REST API. Maybe you've never heard of it before, maybe you have. But because you know it's out there, you can begin thinking about it and how you might incorporate this in your, excuse me, in your work. But this raises a question. When there's things out there such as AngularJS, and there's things out there such as uh, React, and there's things like the REST API, and there's, I mean, you name it, it's out there, and you have no idea how you're supposed to keep up with everything that's out there while maintaining your business, while continuing to be a good developer, connect with those who know more. And that sounds so simple, right? Oh, I just need to talk to people who are wiser than me. Well, that idea of mentorship has been around for thousands of years, and we read it in all these other fields. Why would it be different than ours? And in our specific field, we had the advantage that a lot of people don't, in that we can read blogs, you can write your own blog and invite comments, you can subscribe to newsletters, follow other people on Twitter, as long as you can you know, filter out the noise, and you can talk to those who know other technologies just in case. And this will help you shortcut a lot of what other people may experience when having to learn new technologies. I know that's a lot of information, and I know that that was really fast, but these four points are what I have found to be consistently successful in keeping up with technology. So I've gone from being afraid of not having a job to being able to run a business, to stay current with technology, to be on top of what's out there, to know how to learn what's out there, and to continue to move my business forward. 
So thank you very much for having me, San Diego. You have a fantastic and a beautiful city. If you have any questions at all for whatever time's remaining, I'm open to that. Okay, we'll have questions in the back. Thank you very much for listening.